chapter 17, verses 1 through 11, which is not all of what is sometimes called the high priestly prayer. It's a good portion of it. Beginning with verse 1. After Jesus said this, he has called for peace to fall upon his followers. He looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them. By the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now this is located in John's gospel. We believe in the upper room and the upper room discourse or Jesus' final words and commands to his disciples begins in chapter 13. After days of public acclaim and the final teachings from Jesus before his arrest, they are in a place where they have shared the Passover meal and Judas has been dismissed. Jesus said to him, go and do what you need to do Quickly, the disciples, after Judas left, are told to love one another. They have been promised the Holy Spirit and warned about suffering persecution, as Jesus already has and will to the uttermost. Jesus prays to the Father what we would call an intercessory prayer. It is an open conversation with God the Father, and it becomes a prayer directly and specifically for these, his disciples. In Romans 8.34, Paul writes, Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us intercessory prayer in Hebrews chapter 7 therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him I pray that all of us have come to God through Jesus Christ it's real simple Lord I'm a sinner save me help me to live life by your power therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Intercessory prayer. And then he says, the hour has come. Now, 
Earlier in John's gospel, in chapter 2 at the wedding feast of Cana, in chapter 7, and again in chapter 8, he made it clear, my hour has not yet come. But here, he proclaims it has come. He calls for glory. Glory as we find out what, where Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross." Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, every tongue confess and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And then he begins to pray for the disciples in front of them, in their hearing. He has authority to give eternal life and he defines eternal life as knowing and experiencing an ongoing relationship with the father and the son it's a personal relationship based on intimate knowledge of God how do you get that intimate knowledge prayer fellowship studying God's word This is for the people given to the Son by the Father. He calls them to know the Father, the only true God. This is an exclusive claim. It's offensive to many people throughout the world. How can we say this person, Jesus Christ, is the only way to the Father? It's what our Bible tells us. Know the one that God has sent, Jesus Christ. Jesus says he has glorified the Father by finishing the work given to him, by obeying God's word to God the Son. And how did he do this? At the wedding feast in Cana, he turned pure, clear water to the best tasting wine that someone said they had ever tasted. He drove out the money changers at the temple. He told Nicodemus to be born again. He tells a Samaritan woman she could have living water bubble up out of her. He acknowledged to her that he was the Messiah. He healed an official son by a word at a distance. He healed a man on the Sabbath at the pool of Bethesda. He had to respond to his critics he fed over 5,000 people near the Sea of Galilee. He walked on water. He announced he was the bread of life. He avoided arrest by his powerful, persuasive preaching, even though the officers were told, arrest that man. He has spoken the true words given directly by God to him. He claimed existence before Abraham was born. He healed the man born blind. He raised Lazarus from the dead. He said the miracles performed by him revealed God's power at work through him. He, the, the son glorified the father and asked for the father to glorify himself that he might have the glory he had before becoming incarnate, God in the flesh. He has made the Father's name known to the people that the Father gave him. And he announces, they've kept your word. The disciples who are learning how to keep the word have learned all that the Son received from the Father. And it will take time for all that they have heard to permeate their brains and eventually, I'll use the term, percolate out from them to others that they will 
draw to God. But what did it feel like? Imagine you're, you've been with Jesus perhaps for three years. You've seen him in all kinds of situations. You've seen him challenged by self-proclaimed religious authorities. You've participated in his ministry by going out two by two and allowing God to use you to heal people. You've been through all of this, and now you're in this room with him. And he begins to pray for you specifically. Now, I've had a few times where there's been committees or uh, moments of crisis as a pastor. I asked the people to come and pray for me. They did. That's an amazing experience. They're praying aloud. You're right there. They're laying hands on you, perhaps. And they're praying specifically for you. Here Jesus, whom they know so well, is praying directly and specifically for his disciples. Out loud, in front of them. It can be a tremendous blessing to receive prayer in that kind of situation. Jesus has proclaimed the words of the Father, shared them all with the disciples. And the disciples have learned, they know that the Father sent Jesus the Son. He spoke the truth. And they are called and they do believe in this, the Son of God, sent by God the Father. And so this prayer is on their behalf, not for the whole world, he says in the prayer. And then he proclaims that they are his and yet they are fathers. There's a mutual sharing of these disciples belonging to God. Imagine each of us, every one of us, belongs to God. We could say perhaps it's through the Son, Jesus Christ. We belong to God. And because we belong, there are times when our actions, our words, our service to others, our witness glorifies the Father and Jesus Christ. Before he began to pray this prayer, a couple chapters earlier, he speaks, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Jesus proclaims he's no longer in the world, but the disciples are remaining in the world. And so Jesus, going to the Holy Father, prays for protection for them in the Father's name. In Proverbs 18.10, it tells us, The name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. How many of you have run to home base and you heard the umpire say, safe? That's a whole lot better than out, isn't it? Praying that they may be one as Father and the Son are one. And so Jesus has prayed with confidence of being heard and of God's power to keep these disciples and these disciples gathered in this room. Jesus has prayed for you and for me. Blessed be the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior.